Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the research series. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about observational research methods. So um, I'm going to skip the review questions that I usually do. But um, let's start with the learning objectives. Uh, our first learning objective for the week is to compare quantitative versus qualitative methods for describing behavior. We'll talk about what the concept of a naturalistic observation is, and we'll discuss the methodological issues related to that, such as whether to participate when observing or whether to conceal yourself when observing, and the pros and cons of each of these. We'll also talk about a systematic observation and discuss the various methodological issues that come up from that. Um, discuss issues related to what kind of equipment you use and pros and cons related to that, discussions of reactivity, uh, issues of reliability and sampling. And after we go from naturalistic and systematic observation, we're gonna shift gears into a deep dive into the features of case studies and then archival research. The only, um, piece that's missing in this whole concept is a discussion about uh, survey research, which is also an observational method. Um, so we'll talk about that in uh, another lecture, but um, for now, that is what we intend to do. So let's talk about what qualitative and qu uh, quantitative measures are. So we use the word qualitative uh, to be uh, describing behaviors, oftentimes using words. Whereas when we talk about quantitative uh, approaches, we're talking about uh, statistics and crunching numbers. But uh, there is more to qualitative and quantitative research than just that. So. Let me talk to you about some of the features of qualitative research. So qualitative research oftentimes focuses on behavior in its natural setting. Uh, we describe the world using our own words. Again, that's the buzz uh, word right there. Qualitative research is using words. Many times qualitative research involves collecting in-depth information from small groups of people uh, and uh, among limited settings. And when you collect all this in-depth information, the job is to uh, identify any themes that might emerge. So there are software programs that help you analyze um, qualitative research to identify these themes, but in general, uh, you're looking for patterns. Now we're gonna say later in the concept of naturalistic observation that you should stay uh, in a location for an extended period of time. And you should write in your field journal uh, every day because if you wanna identify patterns or capture themes, you want to make sure that you have enough um, data points or observation points to make a meaningful conclusion. And some people will stay in an area for six months, sometimes a year to collect data. Uh, and a year is a nice round um, number, especially because you have different seasons. And if you're trying to study a culture, uh, there might be, um, events or holidays that occur throughout the year that you want to um, capture. All right. So as I said, qualitative research, the data is um, non-numerical and it's expressed in by the use of language and images. Uh, I will tell you qualitative research is very common in the fields of sociology and anthropology. Right, so a lot of these naturalistic observation techniques. Now, uh, the interpretations that are made are based on the investigator. So is it possible 
that two people could have observed the same events and come to different conclusions, uh, that's possible. We talked about inter-rater, inter-judge reliability, so I'm not going to belabor that point, but it, it is possible that uh, the interpretation that's being made could differ from another person. All right, now let's shift gears to quantitative research. So uh, quantitative research focuses on behaviors that can be easily quantified or put to numbers, right? So we assume, assign numerical values uh, to the responses uh, and, uh, and measure. Um, whereas you noticed in the qualitative research, we assign value through words and pictures. Uh, quantitative research relies a lot on large samples, whereas qualitative research tends to be smaller, uh, uh, smaller in groups or individuals that are studied. And the interpretation comes from statistical analysis. And in a later lecture, we're going to talk all about descriptive and inferential statistics. But uh, when you have quantitative research, uh, you rely on statistical analyses more than uh, your own interpretation. So you can see the difference. Each of these, if you put them side by side, uh, are marks of uh, delineation or, or separation points for uh, qualitative and quantitative research. So let's talk about naturalistic observation. So naturalistic observation occurs when researchers are observing um, in a natural setting. So it's not happening in a lab. So you might hear this referred to as field work. So it's happening in the field over a period of time. Now I mentioned a six month, a year, um, but it could differ. Uh, using a variety of techniques to collect information. And the techniques could be direct observation, journaling, photography, film, uh, interviews, right? There are a lot of different things you could use uh, to do the field work. And then the report, the summary report that emanates from naturalistic observation is based on the researcher's interpretations and findings. Now I said to you, that this approach is as deeply rooted in sociology and anthropology because uh, trying to understand uh, cultures, uh, you have to spend extensive time with that group. And as a non-native to that culture, uh, it's possible that you bring biases in. So any survey that you might think you're going to create could be limited. So you wanna make sure that it represents the group properly. So um, obviously you're driven by observation more than coming in with a specific agenda. So uh, it's used oftentimes, naturalistic observation that is, to describe how people in a culture live, how they work uh, and how they experience uh, uh, a given setting. Now, um, we can talk about the concept of an ethnography, which is a case study of a culture, or we could talk about uh, naturalistic observation research, but both of these require extensive time um, and immersion in the culture to get a, a good understanding. So, um, a silly analogy that I give is imagine you want to know about clubs like dance clubs. Uh, in order to draw a meaningful conclusion about dance clubs in a given area, you're going to need to visit one or more clubs over an extended period of time. Now you might say, well, why this silly example? Uh, first, um, you know, this is not a silly example if you have ever bought a travel book like um, Lonely Planet or I guess TripAdvisor, they all have these reviews, uh, but you need extensive information to draw conclusions about that area, that club, that community. 
But another reason why you want to spend ex extensive time is because when you first go to any community, you're going to be, you're going to stand out. You're going to be a new person. Whereas the more you go, the more you're likely to be accepted. They're going to see you as a regular and see you part of the community. And it isn't just about clubs. Uh, if you were observing, let's say we discovered a new indigenous community um, in Asia or whatever, and um, you wanted to study the values or culture of that community, right? It's going to take time for people to warm up to you, especially if they know that you're observing them. So it takes time to be accepted as a regular. Right. So uh, the description and interpretation uh, strategies or techniques, right, you have to immerse yourself into that experience for an extended period of time. But I said you could use many different data points. So you could use observing, right? It, the word naturalistic observation has observe in it, right? So you can rely on personal observation and um, contemporaneous notes, right? So you take notes in your field journal, but you don't have to rely exclusively on uh, what's in your field journal, you could interview, right? So it's not uncommon when people go to a new culture to interview the heads of that culture. Um, so if there's a tribal chief, you might wanna speak to a chief. If there's a shaman, you wanna speak to the shaman. Um, if there are community leaders who want to speak to community leaders, all of that fills in some of the gaps uh, in your observation. You also want to survey existing documents that are public record, things like newspapers, newsletters, memos, things of that nature could be helpful. And then you can rely on things like audio and visual recordings. Uh, so audio tape or videotape uh, recordings can be useful. And you might say, well, why would you want to record? And the answer is that it's very hard to write and observe at the same time. It's very hard to take notes and capture everything. So if you have an audio or video recording, you could play it back and revisit it over and over and over until you feel like you have a full picture of what's going on. So the using technology to augment your observation could be useful. So what are the goals? The goals of naturalistic observation are to describe a setting event or people, right? And, and within that goal, a sub goal is to get a complete and accurate picture of that group or community or individual. And I, I mentioned this already, but you're going to spend a decent amount of time in that community observing that group, but you should um, make detailed notes and write at least once a day what you observed, because those notes are going to be helpful when you're trying to find themes or categories. So a second goal is to find categories or themes that emerge, right? And it's your job to interpret uh, those uh, experiences and find a pattern. So uh, you're, you're going to find a coherent structure for what happened and then generate a hypothesis to help explain that data. Now, your final report. Okay, so now we've gone from the data collection phase, data analysis phase to disseminating uh, the information. So you're going to write a final report of your results. Now, I would say that in general, we recommend people trying to adhere to chronological order as much as possible. However, uh, if telling a story in chronological order doesn't capture the general theme, it's okay to structure the narrative around the theme over chronological order. So you can, even though there's a general rule to be sensitive to chronological order, you can be flexible in that. Now, 
when we talk about the behaviors, you want to, when you develop a theme, you have to give examples. Uh, so for example, person X did dot, 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 right? So uh, you can't claim a theme or a pattern in behavior unless you have examples. I would say pattern in behavior implies that you should have multiple examples of that specific behavior, not just once, right? So um, when you're reporting data and you wanna confirm a hypothesis, if you're the only observer, you need to see that behavior occur over and over and over to be confident in the conclusions you draw. Now, if you have multiple observers, two or more observers, uh, then you could compare notes to see if uh, you experience the same thing. And it, it you get multiple confirmations across people, not across time that way. So long story short, uh, before we make any conclusion about a community, we need to have multiple um, portrayals. All right. So naturalistic observation, as I said, is typically qualitative. Uh, and the goal is to give rich description about what's happening with that individual or that community. And it's trying to paint a picture. And the best way to paint a picture is with words, right? But that doesn't mean that certain things cannot lend themselves to quantitative analysis. So. Uh, you can have quantitative data alongside your naturalistic observation. And there are examples of quantitative uh, measures that are commonly reported, such as income, the median income of the community, the family size or education levels. You can get aggregate data and, and talk about the profile of the community. Um, now, naturalistic observation oftentimes occurs with the consent of all parties involved. For example, if I were to go on to a reservation, I would need permission from the community to do research and observe. However, if you're doing an observation in a public place and anonymity can be protected, you don't need informed consent. Right, And I think I said in a previous lecture on research ethics that you don't have a right to privacy in a public sphere. And that's important for people to understand. Um, so again, uh, the reason why you don't need consent is that we don't expect a person to do anything that they would want to keep private in public, right? Because they know people could be watching them. All right. So you have some dilemmas, right? So you have some dilemmas whether or not when you're observing, whether you want to be a participant observer or non-participant observer. So to participate or not. Um, if you are a non-participant, that comes with some advantages, right? So you can remain uh, objective and neutral, right? Because you have some distance from the experience. So you observe it, but you don't actively do the experience, right? So you have a, sort of like a bird's eye point of view. Now the bird's eye point of view, you get a broader picture, you can remain objective, but lost in that, the, the downside of being a non-participant is that you don't get a firsthand experience. So the experiential piece is limited because you're observing. Now, to participate, now you're collecting data, but you're also assuming an active role or an insider role. Uh, the benefit is clear, right? So you can experience, you get that experiential richness, that firsthand point of view, and you experience the event the same way as all the other participants, right? You get to observe from the inside. So you get cl uh, closer proximity to the data you're collecting. That's the pros. But the con is that uh, you could lose objectivity. So the more personally connected you are to something, it, you run the risk of remaining objectivity. So um, 
we always tell you to avoid observing your own community because you're, you're gonna feel pressures. So uh, to collect data, do a naturalistic observation on a group that um, is putting pressure to give a glaring, uh, a glowing report or to avoid uh, criticizing your group or vice versa, you're, you can potentially lose objectivity. So uh, you wanna be mindful of the fact that as a participant or a member of that community, you could lose objectivity. All right, the second major thing that you have to consider is whether or not to conceal uh, your uh, purpose or presence, right? So conceal your purpose is you don't tell them why you're there, right? Presence, you literally hide. So what's the benefit of concealment? Well, if people don't know they're being observed, they're gonna be less reactive than when they know they're being observed. So um, when people conceal their presence or purpose, people behave in more natural or authentic ways. So you don't see them change your behavior because you're watching. And that's reactivity. I think we talked about reactivity. The downside of concealment is that in private places, you can't conceal right? Because it could be an invasion of privacy as we talked about, right? Now, the other thing is that I know we're worried about people changing their behavior due to being watched, which does occur. Uh, but if you give people enough time, they will acclimate. They will get used to you. And then eventually they're going to behave more normally, uh, thus rendering concealment unnecessary. So, but the dilemma of whether to participate or to conceal oneself, um, that is strictly up to the researcher. And by now, <clears throat> I'm hoping you start to see that every approach to research has its strengths and weaknesses. There's no perfect design. Uh, there are just considerations uh, that are benefits and drawbacks or pros and cons of a given approach. So. The choice is really the researchers. Now, uh, one of the issues with naturalistic observation is that you don't know what is important, right? So you have to pay attention to everything. The problem with trying to pay attention to everything and collect data on everything is um, it's oftentimes hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to observe and write and pay attention to what's going on all at the same time without missing things. So you may want to study everything about a setting, but I want to be practical that it may not be possible to study everything. So uh, researchers may want to limit their observations to that which is relevant to their study. So you can scale back and I'm going to talk to you about that as we progress. But um, an ethogram, an ethogram is an inventory of all the behaviors that are important to a species, uh, pardon me, a species of animal, right? So, and then you can, once you know the essential behaviors, then you could actually count the number of times that organism behaves in that specific behavior. And you can, um, by frequency counts, determine the relative importance of that behavior. So we do that a lot in animal models, bird, avian models, fish models, and things like that. And, but we could do it in a human model too. So let's talk about uh, the strength and limitations of naturalistic observation. The biggest strength that naturalistic observation has is that it reflects everyday behavior because it's happening in the real world, because it's happening in, in, in a field study rather than a contrived laboratory study. Uh, it reflects everyday behavior. It's also very useful when you don't know what is important, when you don't know anything about a community 
you might have to rely on naturalistic observation because from that data collection, you can develop theories, right? So uh, it's a form of inductive reasoning where you start with observation or data and formulate theories later. Now, here are some of the limitations of naturalistic observation. So one thing is that it can't be used to study all issues, right? So uh, you, it is one technique oftentimes used when very little is known about a topic, right? But um, it becomes less useful in areas that we know more about or well-defined topics. So the more well-defined the hypothesis or the concept you're studying is, uh, the less utility a naturalistic observation has because you could be more specific in the behaviors you wanna score, right? So another issue is that field research is hard to do, right? So a researcher has to remain in an unfamiliar place for extended periods of time, say six months to a year. And if you do uh, this kind of field research, you might have to leave your family for that time. And that's tough when you have a romantic partner, when you have children or some kind of connection to a community, it can be difficult. So the practical side of field research can be challenging, right? Um, another challenge is that because you don't know what's important, you're trying to record all behavior that happens and it becomes hard to do. Uh, you also have to develop hypotheses and uh, modify your hypotheses on an ongoing basis to make sure that whatever hypothesis you have or conclusion you're trying to make matches the behavior. And one of the challenges with that is that sometimes we have what's called a negative case, a set of behaviors or a behavior that doesn't fit into the general theory. And the, the challenge for you, if you do naturalistic observation, is to try and figure out how the framework still makes sense in light of this observation that doesn't fit in. So naturalist, naturalistic observation can be a really challenging thing. So let's shift gears to a more systematic observation. Now, uh, a systematic observation is a careful observation of one or more behaviors in a particular setting. But one difference is that it's far less global. You're no longer observing every single behavior. You're, you have a specific focus of behavior as we talked about in ethograms, right? Now your observations also can be quantified because you can, uh, you're no longer writing in description, but you're scoring number of times a given behavior occurred or things of that nature. And oftentimes you're relying on a priori hypotheses. So you're relying on general theories that exist and systematic observation is more of a deductive reasoning approach. So if you're going to uh, have specific behaviors that you're interested in, you still need to have a coding system. And a coding system is just a, a way of saying a set of rules that you use to categorize observation. And I'm sure you've heard of the concept, the KISS model, keep it simple, sweetheart, right? So the goal is to make sure that your coding system is as simplistic as possible, as easy as possible, uh, because the more complex the coding system, the more error you can have in your data. Now, that's assuming that you're creating your own coding system. It's also possible that you might be relying on pre-existing coding systems or uh, coding systems that were created by other people. If that's the case, they're gonna, it's going to be more manualized and they're going to give you how to score it, right? So... Um, here, I just give you a couple examples of coding systems. So family interaction coding system or fix, right, is 29 categories of interaction between members of the family that you score and the scoring options are given, right? 
Uh, it looks specifically at maladaptive behaviors, how they're learned, how they're maintained. Now, SimLog is a, a system for multiple level observation of, of groups. So here you're coding interactions between people on three dimensions, uh, friendly, unfriendly, ex expressive or controlled, domestic, uh, dominant or submissive. These are ranges, but notice they're spectrum based and the factors that you're looking at, the dimensions that you're looking at are pre-established. So that's also something to consider. Now, let's talk about methodological issues. Uh, you want to ideally uh, utilize uh, um, equipment that you can afford. So the, the cheapest uh, coding strategies or equipment that you could use are paper and pencil. Now, uh, that's the cheapest. However, as mentioned earlier today, um, it's also becoming more common that people video record uh, the observation so that they have a permanent record they could go back to. But you also could get other data points that you wouldn't be able to get if you didn't do it in real time, uh, such as the duration of a trial, right? Um, we have to deal with reactivity, right? So how do we deal with reactivity, right? So just a reminder of the definition of reactivity is people will change their behavior when they know they're being watched. So uh, if you choose to conceal your observation as talked earlier, that could reduce reactivity. And uh, there are ways to do that, such as one-way mirrors, I'm sure you've seen in like Law and Order episodes or things like that, hidden microphones or things of that nature where people um, call, get meaningful data because they don't know they're being recorded or they don't know they're being watched. But if you don't want to conceal yourself, like I said, you can uh, give time. So allow there to be time for the participants to get used to the researcher being there, and that helps. Now, reliability, when we talk about reliability, that's the consistency of the score, whether it reflects the true outcome or true conclusion or some kind of error, right? We talked about that in a previous lecture that reliability is always a combination of true abilities plus error, true score plus error. Now, in systematic observation, uh, usually you have two or more people observing the same thing. They code the same behavior and the more consistent the uh, codes are, the better um, the reliability rating is or the inter-rater reliability. Now, in large scale research studies, if we did uh, videotapes, we can have people um, score video recordings and compare them against previous coders who recorded it in real time. Again, it's a similar inter-rater reliability, but now you're scoring in the moment and then you have another person scoring after the fact. Um, and when you do that, uh, you can look for consistency um, and well-trained observers or coders tend to do a good job. Now, sampling, the longer you are collecting the data, um, the more extensive time you spend, the more accurate you're likely going to get a picture versus a shorter period of time. If you're there for a limited period of time, perhaps you didn't get a full picture. Now, sampling, what kind of, what do we focus in behavior? There are three kinds of uh, sampling when, it, when coding or observing behavior. You could observe the entire stream of behavior. And that approach occurs oftentimes in naturalistic observation, where everything the participant says or does is noted. And that's challenging, as I said earlier, with naturalistic observation. It's just very impractical to do that. So we have to have other approaches to sampling behavior. So event sampling, event sampling is when you have a list of behaviors you want to focus on and you want to see if that behavior occurred or not in a specific time period, right? 
So that's event sampling. Did it occur? Did it not occur? Or how many times did it occur, right? You could also do frequency. Now, time sampling is interesting because it sort of uh, captures more data in a smaller period of time. So it's event sampling broken into smaller parts. That's the best way to say it, right? So uh, if you were to observe, let's say you're a research studying aggression on the playground in a school and you went to recess and you collected data on a particular child, uh, you could either determine that they were aggressive or not, right? Um, that's event sampling. Well, you get one data point that way. What time sampling would do is, let's say the recess was um, 30 minutes. You might chop that 30 minutes up into 30 second intervals. Now you have 60 data points where you can get the relative action of aggression every 30 seconds. So now you get 60 data points in the same recess that makes any, any sense. So in the first 30 seconds, was there aggression? No. Second 30 seconds? No. Third sec 30 seconds? Yes. And what can emerge by doing time sampling is you can uh, identify the relative um, volatility, the ups and down of aggression across that time period. Uh, you can observe uh, when the aggression starts, if it's at the beginning, at the end, to provide additional support. There's a lot of things you can detect with time sampling that event sampling can't do. So, so far we talked about naturalistic observation and systematic observation. We also have a uh, procedure of research called case studies. It, and a case study by definition is an in-depth analysis of an individual. Now the word individual can be somewhat misleading, right? Because an individual could, in a case study, could be an individual person, could be an individual setting or an individual concept. And we're gonna talk about an ethnography, it could be an individual culture, which is a form of a case study, right? So an individual is broader than just one person. So um, be mindful that you're doing a deep dive. Now, we do case studies on very rare occurrences, unusual conditions, things that are outside of the norm. So um, there's not a focus on averages. It's you're focusing on one person or one concept in depth. And I'll give you an example of a case study. There's something called a psychobiography where you do a case study of an individual and try and apply psychological theory to that historical figure. Now, psychobiographies aren't done on people like me who's notably average in most ways, um, but they're done on major figures. So there might be a psychobiography on uh, Abraham Lincoln. I know uh, people have taken a lot of interest in his life and his mental status but you can do a psychobiography and what made that individual who they are and why they made some of the decisions they did. But you, could, you would study unique or important individuals historically. So case studies are for the rare and atypical case, if that makes any sense. So uh, if you're studying uh, individuals from a you know, a mental health point of view or a clinical point of view, the case study would include the history of what is going on, the symptoms, the key behaviors that we want to focus on, um, and then reactions to any treatment, right? So that would be an example. Now, I said case studies are usually done for atypical or unusual individuals. To be unusual, to be atypical, or to be abnormal isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it just means you're unique in it uh, and don't fit into the general framework. So we, we do case studies both on the positive side of things and, and the negative side of things. So 
uh, S is memory, right? So most of us, if we were to try and study things, um, it takes us time. But there are individuals who have what we refer to colloquially as a photographic memory. And they seem to memorize things greater than you or I. We might be interested in, well, what makes them unique? So there was a person called S that was the letter that was assigned to them to describe them and keep them anonymous. And they wanted to understand, well, why is it that they could remember things so quickly? Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, if I were to shuffle a deck of cards, how long would it take you to memorize the sequence of 52 cards? Um, the answer for most people is anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. What if I told you that someone like S could remember over a thousand cards in an hour? So if you gave them an hour, they could report the sequence of all thousand cards in an hour. So that's unique. And you might want to be like, well, hey, what's going on? How does their brain work that allows them to be so successful? And the more common case, which you probably have heard of, is genie and language development. Uh, if you've taken developmental psychology or even a social, psycho social psychology course or sociology course, you might have heard about genie. And genie was locked away in, in her basement uh, by her parents for roughly 13 years. And um, when, they, when she was found, she was entirely nonverbal. She had significant motor impairments. Um, she walked like Frankenstein and um, she had no use of utensils. And this is not normal, right? That's not a typical case. When we think about uh, acquisition of language, people have uh, a pretty good use of language by their first six years of life. And obviously we increase our vocabulary, we learn grammar rules and you know it gets better. But here you had someone who's 13 years old who was entirely nonverbal. And psychologists worked with her for four years. And ultimately, they were able to get her to uh, use some language, two to three word utterances, but that was equivalent to maybe a two-year-old uh, level of language and they worked twice as hard, twice as long. Uh, so that gives you insight into uh, language acquisition. And there was a debate in, among um, theorists, Noam Chomsky and B.F. Skinner about how language is acquired. And Chomsky said, no, we have this innate, you know, system that allows us to uh, develop and acquire language, the language acquisitional device. Whereas Skinner said, oh, no, it's due to observation and reinforcement. And what this study demonstrated is that the observation and reinforcement has a window of time that it must occur. And if it doesn't occur, it's going to be interfered with. So observation and reinforcement is insufficient for language acquisition, right? So timing matters and all, there are a whole lot of other factors that matter. Uh, and that's re referred to as a sensitive period. All right. So what's the benefits of a case study? Uh, one benefit of a case study is that it gives you uh, deep, rich uh, insights into an individual, right? However, you have to be careful of a um, research bias where the researcher alters the data in a way to support what they're trying to claim. That's always a concern. And you also have to worry about whether uh, this generalizes out to an individual. And that actually is the biggest criticism of case studies is its limited generalizability. All you know is the individual. And that individual does not reflect the larger group necessarily. 
So an ethnography, as I said, is a similar method to case study, but it's a case study of a culture, trying to understand the unique values and, and, and social processes of that culture. Uh, you know, similar to the case study, it focuses on an in-depth analysis, but it's more in a group format. But the same limitations are at play, right? So you have to worry about the researcher bias and you have to worry about generalizability, nothing changed. So we could also observe people through psychophysiological me methods. So we could uh, get an understanding of how people function through uh, bodily responses, right? So there is a connection between physiology and behavior. So uh, something like the galvanic skin response measures sweating or the electromyogram measures muscle tension. These two indicators um, could predict anxiety or stress. In fact, that's why they're used uh, as part of the lie detector test. And EEG, an you know, electroencephalogram measures the firing of neurons in the brain or the electrical activity. Uh, you can measure things like sleep disturbances or seizures through an EEG. We have MRIs, which gives you pictures of the brain, right? So by looking at a picture of the brain, you could identify tumors and you could identify lesions on the brain and you could identify um, shrinking of various parts of the brain. So things like uh, multiple sclerosis, you can see through imaging techniques, things like schizophrenia, you could see through imaging techniques because the ventricles widen or uh, Alzheimer's disease, you could see the shrinking of the hippocampus, right? So these could give you insight as well. So what are some of the benefits of psychophysiological methods? Well, straightly, uh, one, it connects the brain to the body. So we're linking biological factors, brain structures to behavior. Uh, and two, it allows you to tap into the functioning of nonverbal organisms like babies. Now, when we talk about it, there are also some limitations, right? So uh, many factors influence a physiological response, such as anxiety. If anyone's had an MRI or a CAT scan or an fMRI, uh, they might develop anxiety. And that fear response could be induced by the equipment, not necessarily an internal state. So we have to be mindful of that. Now, last but not least for this uh, lecture, we have to talk about archival research. So archival research involves developing an understanding about a behavior or a concept by compiling, compiling pre-existing research, pre-existing information, pardon me. So you're not doing original research, you're diving into existing documents. So they could be statistical research or, or records, they could be survey archives, they could be written mass communication records, and they tell a story. So statistical records are collected um, uh, throughout the, the, the world and throughout the country for many different purposes. And I'll give you an example. One of the largest or most extensive statistical records out there is the US Census. Every 10 years, uh, we collect data on the population to get a, a profile, a snapshot of the, the population in, and its demographics, right? And that is used to determine funding sometimes, it's used to determine voting uh, and so many other things, but the, um, it's very exhaustive and captures uh, many of the demographics of a country. There are other ones too that you might not think about, public health statistics. So every time you go to an emergency room, there's a reporting there, um, COVID-19, right? There's public health statistics there. John Hopkins University is doing a great job with that. Every time you take the SAT or GRE, uh, ETS is collecting data on the, the, um, the whatchamacallit, the norms, the means, and what's expected. So these are statistical records. And, you know, one of my favorite is baseball, right? Baseball 
there's a statistic for everything. And it seems like every year they add a new term and a new statistic, right? So uh, if you were a pitcher, they used to talk about wins and losses. But when um, they changed from pitching the whole game, then they went wins and losses, but they added saves. And then as the duration of uh, how long a pitcher would throw uh, got reduced, they added holds. And there are all kinds of other statistics that people use uh, to determine uh, decisions on the baseball field. Now, so that's statistics. We also have survey, survey archive, survey data, um, ICPSR, um, which is an inter-university consortium of political and social research. Uh, they make their data available. So if you want to use pre-existing data, there are a whole host of questions that they have available that people can look into. There's also the GSS, the General Social Survey. The General Social Survey uh, is through the National Science Foundation, has roughly 200 questions covering a variety of topics. Uh, you can crunch data through that. And then obviously the internet has a whole bunch of um, large data um, and data banking. Now, what's interesting is in research, there is a push to register our data sets, right? So this is something relatively new, but um, we, we are being encouraged to register our data sets, but that will also allow researchers to access some of our data and run either a secondary analysis or see if they came to the same conclusion we did using our data set. So that's uh, archives, right? Now we talk about written and mass communication records. So my belief is that written and mass communication records give you a snapshot of what's happening at a given time, right? Uh, so diaries, the diary of Anne Frank became very popular. And one of the reasons it became popular is because it gave you uh, a picture of a coming of age story of a, 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 a young Jewish girl uh, during the Holocaust being hidden away uh, in, um, hidden away in an apartment, right? So that gives you a picture, right? And without that diary, we wouldn't know some of those insider points of view. We also have letters. Uh, there are letters written uh, by heads of state, right? Um, every time a president leaves office, they historically, since Ronald Reagan, they have written a letter to the next president giving them kind of um, a parting word that gives you a picture of how they viewed the country at that point. There are letters from key, um, key therapists like Sigmund Freud wrote a whole bunch of letters that are in the Library of Congress that are to be opened and he set different dates. Maybe that'll change our picture of Freud and you know, how he interacted with his patients. We have ethnographies, which we talked about and we have public records, right? Now communication records also tell a story. So these are uh, books and magazines and movies and television and newspapers. All of these communication records tell a story. Now, I won't go into all of them, but let's go into two in particular. I wanna talk about movies and television shows. So if you wanna know the change in travel and safety and security post 9-11, all you have to do is watch Home Alone, right? Home Alone is a, you know, a classic holiday movie where um, Kevin McAllister is always uh, forgotten. But I bring that up because um, if you look at it, when they realize it, that, pardon me, when they realize they're late, um, for their flight, right? They run through the airport all the way up to where they check in. Now, it, it used to be before 9-11 that you checked in right by the plane, 
right? So uh, you got your ticket and you boarded the plane right outside the plane. Now we have TSA where you have a whole series of screening uh, strategies that occur. Uh, so that's a big difference. And you could see in that movie, it's like, hey, why did they run all the way up to the plane? How was that possible? Uh, well, it was a different world. And, and the movie tells that story. Uh, now let's talk about a, a television show. I grew up watching Saved by the Bell. Now Saved by the Bell, they did a reboot. I know that's out now, but Saved by the Bell uh, can give you an idea of what technology looked like or what cell phones look like. If you look, uh, I guess it's one of the first shows that showed a, a, a cell phone uh, in the television program and it was a big brick. Uh, so Zach Morris had that, right? But if you were to look at uh, the morphology of cell phones from that point till now, right? there's been a massive change, right? So at that point, all it was was a dialing device you can make a phone call. Well, since then, we added concepts like text messaging, sending messages, short uh, media messages. Uh, then we added internet access, right? The smartphone revolution with Apple and iPhone. And then now we added all kinds of social media technology. And now we have all kinds of references and music videos about that that weren't there. So if you want to see the morphology or the development of the use of technology, look no further than uh, tele television. But anyway, you get the idea. So, and when doing archival research, right? So you want to do a systematic analysis of all the existing documents in the archive. So similar to the naturalistic and the systematic observation is absolutely essential to have a coding system. Uh, now, What's nice, the good thing about archival research is that it gives you uh, answers to questions that could not be addressed in other ways. The downside is that you're relying on uh, records that are publicly accessible or you can gain, get a handle on. So it might be difficult to obtain them. And even if you do obtain them, you have to question the accuracy of them. So, Let's do a larger picture. What's the, from a bird's eye point of view, uh, what are some of the benefits of observational uh, research or descriptive methods, right? In, re in a previous lecture, we said observational research studies allow you to describe behavior, right? So um, it gives you uh, basic foundations or fund fundamental knowledge. It's flexible. You, you're very pragmatic in this. You get, and ethological and ecological validity. So you're studying in a natural habitat and, and it, you know that it generalizes to the larger setting. Uh, some of the problems is the lack of reproducibility, right? So sometimes um, the next person observes it might be different because cultures change as well, right? You can also have anthropomorphizing where you give human-like qualities to animals. And because you don't have control, it's happening in the field, you have less control over the environment. So you have issues of internal validity and reactivity. And that is our lecture. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, yeah, we'll continue uh, next time. Take care, everybody.